Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, this webinar on the EUCS Triple D, the EU Redemption Circulation. On behalf of the Madame Sunsky Kalanumpur and Marco Winter, of the next to me. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Kate. Department. Um, today we have a mixed session, so we're in the meeting room. Physically with me are representatives from various Dutch companies. Um, we're also a member of the RTC working group. Um, everybody that's online that is not a member yet, please feel free to join in um, because it means you can also join us. So today we will be discussing more in depth about the EU mobility regulation that was concluded quite recently. And we have learned that there's quite a number of companies with questions about what's in it, what we to to around it, is there any support, etc. And for that very reason, we have found um, Mr. Jeroen Kiber, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands, today to go give us all the answers in the upcoming one hour. Um, before I give the floor to you, I would like to just make a few comments for everybody to be aware. Firstly, this meeting will be recorded, and depending on the you know, sensitivity of the discussion, obviously, we don't have confidential information to leak out, but we are planning to uh, post it on our YouTube channel. The Netherlands has a YouTube channel. That also has webinars, previous sessions on responsible business conduct, but also Please look it up. And so, with your participation, we presume you agree with the films. Um, also, there is a chat box in which you can type your questions. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, um, we will take those questions and make sure that you don't answer them all. Um, and yes, I think that it is. So please try to question during the presentation. But with that being said, um, I would like to give the floor to Jeroen Berg, a senior policy officer at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on responsible business conduct, to take the floor and guide us through the EUC Triple D and all the developments in the government sector. Thank you so much, Yes, thank you, Eva, and uh, thank you for having me uh, in this meeting uh, in your uh, working group and uh, also with external visitors in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, thanks also to Marco from the NDBC to uh, to organize this together with the embassy. Um, yes, <laughs> see you both. Um, my name is Johan Verber. As I said, I work in the Responsible Business Conduct Unit in the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, and I will uh, guide you through uh, an introduction to the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive uh, that was uh, recently adopted. Um, I'll take a small step back and explain a little bit about the Dutch RBC policy uh, and also the OECD guidelines and what the due diligence steps um, entail. Uh, and then we will dive into the uh, the CS Triple D, uh, as the acronym is, is used, uh, explain to you what are uh, some of the aspects of it, the main topics, uh, and also uh, how uh, due diligence, the due diligence process, is uh, is uh, is taken up in this uh, in this directive. Um, I believe you are hosting the slides, so um, can you go to the next slide, please? They were not shared yet. Yes, so if you can go to the next slide. So the Dutch RBC policy, uh, this policy was adopted in uh, 2020. Uh, and Previously, this was uh, this uh, the Dutch RBC policy was mainly built on voluntary measures, uh, but after an evaluation, uh, it became apparent uh, that we need a, a so-called smart mix of binding and voluntary measures. Um, 
with the main element being a broad due diligence legislation and uh, preferably at EU level. So we're very happy that uh, that has been accomplished. Um, the binding and voluntary measures uh, are, are designed to be mutually reinforcing. Um, so the voluntary measures can also help uh, companies to uh, to uh, to fulfill the, uh, the, the to do to due diligence legislation obligations. Um, main topics you see in the figure on the right. Um, so the due diligence requirements that are set in law um, are the main aspect. Um, we also set uh, RBC conditions. Uh, so, for example, conditions when companies want to join trade missions, uh, they are asked if they are familiar and obliged to the, uh, the OECD guidelines. Uh, there are a number of financial uh, incentives, uh, uh, grants that are um, or subsidies that are uh, available uh, when companies want to work on their due diligence process. Um, the other aspect is uh, sectoral cooperation. So within a sector, companies can uh, can collaborate. Uh, and, and work on due diligence steps, uh, and that's um, that's being um, stimulated and uh, and also uh, comes with a with a subsidy. Um, and last but not least, the, uh, the so-called RBC support office in the Dutch uh, Enterprise Agency uh, that is available to all companies. So not only companies that will fall under the legislation, um, but um, companies that want to work on their due diligence process um, either as their first steps into this uh, field uh, or also more experienced companies that are uh, looking for advice uh, can uh, can reach uh, can reach out to them uh, next slide please can we go to the next slide please I don't see it move to the next slide on my screen, but yes, there we are. Ah, so <laughs> the OCD guidelines and what are these six, uh, six steps of due diligence for those uh, that are uh, less aware of this. Um, OCD guidelines as well as the UNGPs have this, this framework of due diligence. Uh, and, and it is more or less comparable in the steps that are expected from companies. Um, so the first step for companies is to embed responsible business control into their policies and management systems. Uh, so set up uh, a policy uh, and, and make a plan how you're going to um, analyze the risks in your, uh, in your own operations and your value chain. Um, and that is the uh, that's the that's the second step. So uh, identify, assess uh, those adverse impacts, the risks in your uh, in your own operations and supply chain, um, and um, and make an action plan uh, after prioritization, uh, which uh, which adverse impacts uh, you will address first. Um, the third step is this action plan. So try to seize, prevent, or mitigate these adverse impacts. Um, and uh, that can be um, in collaboration with stakeholders. Um, and once you're there, you have to uh, you have to track um, the implementation of this action plan uh, and um, see what kind of results uh, it yields. Um, and also communicate on this. So in your reporting, uh, uh, provide insights in, in uh, which steps you took to address the adverse impacts uh, and what the results are. In case uh, you are uh, involved in, in, in actual uh, adverse impacts uh, that caused harm or damage to, uh, to, for example, local communities, the sixth step is the uh, is the remediation. So provide for uh, for remedy or, depending on your involvement, uh, uh, cooperate uh, with uh, with remediation, um, and the type of involvement can be that you are actually causing uh, the adverse impact. Uh, or either you have been contributing it uh, through collaboration with a company that caused it. Uh, and there's also the possibility of being directly linked uh, in your chain to, uh, to an adverse impacts. 
depending on your involvement, uh, it uh, it requires yeah, different uh, forms of using your influence to uh, to address this adverse impact. Main main point here is, uh, as you see, it's it's it are six steps. Uh, there's no expectations that companies can do this overnight. It is a process, uh, and and you are. Um, uh, the Dutch government expects that you start with the first steps, um, but no company can uh, can can complete these six steps overnight. Um, so also approach it as a process, uh, make a plan uh, on what timeline uh, you're gonna fulfill these steps. Um, next slide, please. Yes. So the corporate sustainability due diligence directive. Um, main objective of this uh, directive is that large companies uh, will be obliged to uh, to conduct due diligence. Uh, as mentioned, it um, it spans your own operations uh, and the value chain. I will get into the details of which part of the value chain, or so called chain of activities, as being referred to now, uh, is involved. Um, and this due diligence process uh, has to identify, prevent, and address those adverse impacts, as mentioned, regarding human rights and the environment. Some of the timelines of the negotiations. So the proposal by the European Commission after several delays came in, in February, 2022, uh, after which uh, negotiations started uh, between the, the member states in the council. Um, Council position was reached in um, in December 2022, um, and uh, that uh, also opened uh, yeah started a process for the European Parliament to uh, to reach its position. Um, that was roughly a half a year later in June 2023, upon which the uh, the trilogue uh, negotiation started between uh, the European Commission, the Council, and the European Parliament. Um, and a provisional political agreement was reached in um, in December 2023. Um, and everyone thought, uh, we are there now, uh, and, and the text is final. Um, but in this case, uh, provisional was really provisional, um, because in February, um, when, in theory, the administrative steps of guiding it through the Council and uh, EP, uh, had to be taken um, in the council. New uh, new discussions started again uh, on some of the aspects, uh, and um, yeah, we uh, we were at risks of um, even losing uh, the political agreement. Um, luckily, with some adjustments um, that I will get to later, um, for example, on the scope of the directive, um, and the final adoption was uh, was made possible, um, and on the. 24th of May, uh, it finally also got the uh, the council approval after already the, uh, the EP approval in in April. Um, right now, we're waiting on the um, the publication of the final text. Um, it's foreseen for uh, for July, um, and um, and then it will uh, yeah officially enter into force. Next slide, please. So main topics of the uh, corporate sustainability due diligence, due diligence directive. Um, due diligence, um, most important uh, uh, improvement from the commission proposal uh, is a better alignment with the OECD guidelines and UNGPs, uh, particularly uh, the risk-based approach that uh, was, uh, was added to it. Originally, the Commission proposal um, contained uh, a different approach, uh, looking at uh, established business relationships uh, as as criteria for uh, for doing your due diligence, um, meaning that you would only have to uh, check uh, within your own operations and value chain uh, with your established business relationships whether uh, whether there were no adverse impacts. Um, this is not in the uh, so-called spirit of the OECD guidelines, um, which, uh, which which start from a risk-based approach um, and ask you to uh, check in your entire value chain where, where uh, the most severe risks are. Um, 
And often that is maybe not with your established business relationships, but can be further down the chain. Um, so this was a, yeah, a big step for the Netherlands. We also uh, uh, pushed for this in the, uh, in the negotiations that, uh, that this was, uh, was changed. Um, with regard to the scope, which companies will fall under this directive? Um, so this was heavily debated uh, and altered in the end. Um, but we ended up with, uh, with EU companies uh, with over a thousand employees and 400 50 million euros of net turnover worldwide um, and non-EU companies with a, with a similar turnover uh, on the EU market. Um, so those are uh, yeah, the, 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 third, uh, the third country uh, companies that, uh, that are active on the European market uh, and, and have their revenues there. Um, and um, for, for the enforcement, uh, they will look in which uh, in which uh, which EU company uh, the biggest revenues are uh, for the uh, supervisory authority to uh, to do uh, to do the checks. Um, also important, uh, we don't start right away with these um, uh, thresholds of a thousand employees and four hundred fifty million net turnover. Uh, there will be a phase in application. Um, so three years after entering into force, the first uh, group of companies. Uh, We'll, we'll have to uh, follow up the, uh, the obligations and these are companies with over 5,000 employees um, and, and 1.5 billion net turnover. Um, a year later, companies with 3,000 employees and 900 million net turnover. And then after two years, um, the final uh, anticipated group with 1,000 employees and 450 million net turnover. Um, Next slide, please. So the value chain, uh, as I mentioned already, uh, also heavily debated um, in the original uh, commission proposal, the entire value chain uh, was foreseen to, uh, to be taken into account um, during the negotiations, different variations of, of defining uh, the value chain uh, past. Um, in the end, it ended up on the so-called chain of activities, uh, which at least includes the, uh, the entire supply chain, uh, so the upstream part uh, for a company's operations, and the partial chain after sales, so the downstream part um, that will contain uh, at least the distribution, uh, the transport, and the, the storage of products. Um, so this does not include, for example, the disposal or the, the recycling of products. Um, main result of this uh, comes down to the financial sector, um, which, uh, of course, their, their biggest um, adverse impacts are in the downstream part, um, the financing of uh, projects, uh, the loans they have to, uh, to companies. Uh, these do not fall under the... Uh, under the obligations now. Um, and that was, uh, yeah, that was at least for the Dutch financial sector, uh, something disappointing. They are, they are already doing this um, and, and wanted to fall under this directive um, and are now a little bit left at the side um, to, yeah, to be included in this part. Of course, their upstream um, due diligence is still as expected. Um, and also the next point on the, uh, the climate transition plan. <clears throat> um, but of course, yeah, the adverse impacts in their upstream uh, chain are, uh, are, yeah, are less interesting. Um, so that is, uh, yeah, on our part, disappointing that uh, that didn't uh, came through. Um, on climate, um, also something that was already <clears throat> in the original commission proposal, um, and uh, uh, discussed heavily um, the obligation of, uh, of developing uh, a climate transition plan in line with the climate goals of the, the Paris Climate Agreements and the EU climate law. Um, so this is the obligation uh, to, uh, uh, as we said, uh, not increase, but more than 1.5 degrees um, in, in, the, uh, in the timelines of 2030 and 2050. Um, 
the transition plan uh, will have to include uh, reduction targets um, and where relevant and uh, next to scope one and scope two also scope three emissions. Um, these reduction targets have to be uh, set for 2030 and then incremental also up to 2050 uh, to, um, to apply to the 50% reduction target and uh, ultimately in 2050, the 90% reduction target. Um, with regards to enforcement, um, so there's a mix of administrative and civil liability. Um, original commission proposal also included uh, director duties under civil liability. Um, well, several member states um, already indicated that that was uh, properly addressed uh, within their national legislation and um, managed, uh, yeah, in the negotiations to uh, to leave that out of the uh, of the enforcement part. Um, what is now agreed upon also is uh, with regard to, um, to to penalties um, that a maximum fine can be set of uh, at least five percent of the net turnover, um, and this is of course uh, under the mandate of a national supervisory authority that uh, that have to, has to be appointed, um, and also these national uh, supervisory authorities. Uh, the Commission will set up an, an EU network. Uh, so these supervisory authorities can collaborate uh, and also to uh, to guarantee uh, that enforcement is uh, yeah is comparable between member states uh, within the European Union um, and that a company uh, for example uh, when involved of course is not um, yeah uh, that is not addressed differently in, in, in several member states then on the next slides please the uh, due diligence obligations specifically that are now um, into the uh, CSDD. Um, so what is exactly in the articles uh, that companies have to live up to? Um, it goes back to the uh, to the six steps that uh, that I presented on due diligence, uh, and um, as that is an yeah uh, of course a voluntary standard uh, with open norms the uh, the, the challenge was uh, to uh, to get this set in the articles uh, and, and write it into law, uh, so that companies have um, yeah uh, a clear um, a clear um, approach of how to do their due diligence and uh, be in compliance with this uh, directive. Um, so um, first step and what is also included in one of the articles is to integrate their due diligence into company policies and the risk management system. Um, and upon that, uh, start the uh, the process of your risk analysis within your own operations and the value chain uh, definition that I gave. So to identify and access any actual or potential adverse impacts uh, that are present. Um, Important step afterwards, the prioritization. Um, important to notice that uh, companies are not expected to address all adverse impacts that they come across. Um, that would uh, that would be almost impossible to ask from a company uh, that is working worldwide uh, as a multinational. Um, so make a prioritization of the uh, most severe uh, adverse impacts that you wanna address first. And, um, and communicate on this so it's clear um, what are your next steps. Um, of course, um, um, in the action plan, uh, try to prevent uh, the potential adverse impacts um, and also uh, do this um, with support of involved stakeholders. Uh, so when this is in your upstream uh, supply chain, uh, work together with your suppliers uh, to see how you can um, can prevent uh, uh, any potential, yeah, or at least address any risks that you see, um, be it labor circumstances, uh, child labor, um, uh, if there's a, if there's a risks in the sector in the country where you're operating, um, see work together with your supplier to uh, to address this. Um, in case there are actual adverse impacts, uh, you are obliged to to bring them to an end. 
um, again, do this with the engagement of, uh, of stakeholders. Um, when communities are affected, uh, uh, engage with them and, and see how um, it can be bring, brought to an end. Um, and as mentioned, uh, if, if, if there's uh, harm being done, um, provide rem remediation for the actual adverse impact. Um, also something that's added to the obligation is the, um, the setting up of a, of a complaint or notification mechanism, so-called complaints procedure um, on company level. Um, so when adverse impacts do take place, um, people that are affected by it, um, the first step that they can do is, uh, is file a complaint uh, with the company um, and first go through that process to come to a solution with the company uh, opposed to uh, immediately going to court, for example. Um, the idea is that companies uh, and um, people that are affected first come to a solution together. Um, as mentioned, monitoring of the due diligence process um, and this risk analysis, uh, it's also obliged to, uh, to do an annual adjustment so every 12 months. Uh, the directive prescribes that you reevaluate this risk analysis. Um, for example, when you, um, when you change your operations, uh, when you moved into a new production location, uh, either in a different country, uh, of course, this, uh, this might require you to, uh, to reevaluate the risks uh, that are present in that location. Um, and finally, the, uh, the communication communication on your due diligence approach. Um, so within your reporting, um, explain the due diligence process that you've taken with the scope that is now for this uh, due diligence directive. Um, all these companies also fall under the uh, so-called corporate sustainability reporting directive. Um, so automatically uh, that will uh, require them to also report on the on the due diligence uh, process under that directive. Um, for the exceptional company, uh, for example, maybe non-EU companies, um, there are obligations on reporting, for example, to uh, to publish something on their website on, on their due diligence approach. Um, one final note on this maybe is the uh, maximum harmonization of a number of articles. Um, in this due diligence, in these due diligence obligations. So the underlined uh, obligations here are, are so-called maximum harmonized. So uh, member states within the national um, uh, implementation of this law uh, cannot change anything on, uh, on, on how these uh, obligations are, uh, are, are, are formulated. Uh, so one-on-one -on -one, um, implementation has to take place. Uh, and there's no possibility to uh, to to alter that as a as a member state. Next slide, please. Then for companies that are um, are now under falling under this directive and, and maybe haven't started this uh, due diligence process yet, um, and are maybe thinking. You are maybe in a room like wh where to start and, and how can I do this? Uh, how am I expected to do this by myself? Um, there are a number of support measures um, already within the directive. Um, there is uh, some obligations, uh, as mentioned, to collaborate with stakeholders. Um, so when adverse impacts are uh, being found, uh, in, for example, in your supply chain and your uh, you are uh, you are uh, expected to work together um, with involved suppliers to, uh, to, uh, to, to bring this to an end. Um, so, for example, uh, there is at least at least with the small and medium enterprises, uh, there is a there is a fear of uh, a lot of obligations uh, um, being pushed uh, down to them, uh, being in their supply chain. Um, but the directive, yeah, clearly states that uh, that these uh, that these parties have to work together. Um, the directive also leaves room for so-called multi-stakeholder initiatives, um, so that uh, allows companies to um, to to work together, uh, for example, in a sector, um, and um, that you don't have to do it by yourself. So, 
for example, you can imagine that uh, companies uh, within a sector uh, are, are are working in the same supply chain, um, and then uh, yeah, it would be a waste of time, for example, to each individually uh, on that same supply chain and do your risk analysis while there might be a lot of uh, overlap um, within your supply chain. So if you can work together with companies uh, to um, to to identify these these main risks in your supply chain um, that is being stimulated by the directive. Um, in the end, it cannot be seen as a, as a kind of a safe haven. Like if I if I work together, uh, I I will have fulfilled my obligations. Uh, in the end, a supervisory authority will will always look at the uh, and the at the individual um, responsibility that companies have to uh, to perform their due diligence. Um, but getting the information from your supply chain um, and, and working together on that is uh, is something that is possible. Um, next to that, there will also be guidance from the European Commission. Um, in a number of articles, uh, they refer to guidance, for example, on the due diligence process, uh, but also on the uh, transition uh, plan on climate uh, that, is, that is expected. Um, so those are items that the Commission will also provide guidance on. Um, we hope they um, they will be swift in that. Um, first timelines that we're seeing now uh, will be uh, close to um, to uh, to the years of the implementation uh, or the uh, the phase in application. Um, so hopefully we can uh, urge them to uh, to come with this guidance uh, as soon as possible. Um, and last but not least, the uh, the RBC support office that I mentioned uh, at the uh, Netherlands Enterprise Agency. Um, that is something that uh, that companies, uh, uh, the Dutch companies, that uh, will have to deal with this directive um, and have operating facilities um, in Malaysia. Uh, they can always uh, approach uh, the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. Um, we can uh, we can share a link to the website uh, and and contact information. Um, after this session, um, to um, to uh, yeah allow you to uh, to approach them if you uh, if you have questions on, on what is expected uh, and how you can start with your uh, due diligence process. Um, finally, the the timeline um, as mentioned, so we are waiting for the um, official publication of the text, the final text, um, and formally. 20 days after that publication, the uh, the directive will enter into force. Um, so that will either be in July or if 20 days later is in August, it will be in August um, of, to, of this year. Um, then member states have two years to uh, to implement the directive in national legislation. Uh, so that will be by the summer of 2026. Um, and also within two years, the, uh, the commission uh, is expected to uh, to report on due diligence by the financial sector. As, as mentioned, um, the financial sector is now not completely captured by the directive, um, and uh, but there is an evaluation clause uh, put in the directive to uh, to see whether, uh, in light of all the other legislation that go, comes to the financial sector, uh, whether um, there is a way to uh, to better capture them under this directive. Then 2027 to 2029, as mentioned, the, uh, the phase in application of the companies in scope. So by the different thresholds uh, that I presented. Uh, and six years after entering into force, the, uh, the first evaluation by the commission is foreseen. Um, and the directive uh, specifies that in this first evaluation, they have to look into the effects on uh, small, medium enterprises. Uh, how are they affected by this directive being not uh, falling directly under the scope, um, but through the value chain and maybe the request for information, um, they want to see what is the effect on SMEs and is this, and is this um, uh, something that they can um, that that is yeah doable for them, uh, or do we have to find other support measures uh, for them? Um, and there will also be a review of the applicable scope. Um, as mentioned, this was something that was heavily debated. Uh, originally, the thresholds were lower. 
um, companies with more than 500 employees and uh, 150 million in net turnover. Um, so after the first experience has been done um, with the scopes that are now agreed upon, um, they will review uh, whether this is still uh, yeah the best approach uh, or whether maybe other companies will also fall under this directive. Um, the Netherlands in the negotiation uh, pushed for uh, alignment with the uh, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive regarding to scope. Um, and um, well, because for us, it made sense that the companies that have to do the due diligence uh, then also report on it. Um, and now we are in the, um, yeah, in a situation where um, fewer companies have to actually do a due diligence process but a lot more companies under the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive are expected to, to report on their due diligence process. Um, although by the CSDD, they are not obliged to do a due diligence process. So yeah, that's a gap that can hopefully be addressed um, in the future. Um, but for now, uh, I think for, for us, uh, for the Dutch government, at least it's positive that there, there is a directive. Um, there will be an obligation on a European level um, important for us uh, for the level playing field uh, for companies uh, that throughout the European Union uh, same ex expectations will be set for companies on, uh, on their due diligence um, yeah and on that note I think we are close to the time that was uh, expected for me and um, happy to uh, to answer any questions from your side Um, I'm muted. You can go. Uh, thank you so much, Jeroen, for the for the very insightful presentation. Um, Marco just whispered that uh, after my first introduction uh, 45 minutes ago, a few uh, additional people uh, joined the meeting. So also welcome to those uh, people. Um, uh, there was a question box. Um, or uh, any uh, questions you might have. So far, nothing has been typed there, but feel free to do so. Um, if not, uh, I have a few questions already from my side, and maybe some people in the room will have a few questions as well. Um, just to share with everybody um, that uh, we're doing this as part of the Responsible Business Conduct Working Group that the MDC and MDC DC has established uh, more or less a year ago, um, where we have usually open session uh, presentations on topics like now this regulation, but we also have sessions with people from Boers in Malaysia or uh, uh, METI or other parties, uh, deepening our knowledge on responsible business conduct, both what's happening in the Netherlands and Europe, uh, but also what's already ongoing in, in Malaysia. And how to best use that. Um, maybe um, that's the advantage of being a chair of me. You can ask some questions first. So, uh, I have just two questions from my side, or the most urgent ones, and then I will look again to the both online or most people in the meeting room uh, for their questions. Firstly, uh, so now we have an EU. Uh, um, directive, um, and I think it, you said it needs to be converted to national legislation. Um, so my question is, what can you share about it? Um, what's to be expected? Will there be changes compared to the EU regulation? Will there be top-ups? Um, who will implement it? Um, what can you share about that? Uh, secondly, I was wondering, Many uh, Dutch multinationals have entities throughout Europe. And what, what does that mean? If are they will they fall under both the Dutch implementation act but also say under the French and Italian ones? So how how will we align and, and what's expected to happen uh, there? And um, thirdly, um, I was wondering uh, what you can also share about other regulations or directives that are being uh, prepared. Uh, there is the CBAM, there is the CSRD um, and others. Um, 
So uh, how are they related or linked to the due diligence regulation and or directive? Um, and how do we work on continuous those alignments? I think that was a big question. Let me start with that and then we'll go back to the floor for other questions. Yes, thank you, Eva. Good questions and uh, some things that I can uh, address at least. Um, so with regard to the national legislation or the national yeah, implementation of this directive, um, as mentioned, after it's formally entered into force, uh, member states have two years. Um, and in the Netherlands, we already started with the preparations. Um, so, um, and... Um, Roughly in the first nine months now, uh, we will work towards uh, an internet consultation uh, where the, the draft legislation text uh, will be open for, uh, for feedback. Um, leading up to this uh, consultation, uh, of course, we are in close contact with the, uh, with the different departments uh, within the Dutch government that are, uh, that are involved in this justice department, but also economic affairs course has an opinion on this legislation and where which topics to focus on um the um with regard to changes um as mentioned there are a few articles that are uh so-called harmonized within the agreement uh, and, and nothing can uh, be changed on those articles or how they are formulated um all the other parts of the directive um are in theory open for uh, member states to um, uh, to yeah to see if they change details maybe to accommodate uh, some national situation um, for the Netherlands uh, the general approach of um, of the cabinet has been and will be now with the new cabinet coming in um, to uh, to uh, uh, how to say it in English at least. Um, yeah, to avoid any any top ups um, and 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 implement this uh, as close as possible to the EU uh, directive. Um, this is yeah from a consideration with regard to regulatory burden for companies uh, and, and a lot of expectations that are already up on them. Um, so uh, no guarantee like for all the aspects that that it will be one on one the, the eu directive um but um yeah at least the intention of cabinets uh, and probably also uh, current setup of, of parliament um the uh, yeah if we if if we change significant things or do top ups on uh, for example the scope uh, in theory you can you can apply a different scope uh, there are stakeholders in the Netherlands from the from NGO side or from other uh, perspectives that, uh, for example, ask us to uh, to include the financial sector in the Netherlands. Um, um, but I think that will also, yeah, that will immediately affect the level playing field. Uh, you already uh, mentioned uh, a presentation of, of multinationals and different EU companies. Um, so, so. Uh, Think for example, if, if the Netherlands would do that, and then a financial company uh, will will have will fall under the obligations in one member state and not in the other. So that's something that uh, that we obviously don't want. And the the level playing field, the level playing field has always been a, a main argument for the Dutch government to to get this EU legislation. Um, so in that regard, um, I'm not expecting um, a significant top-ups uh, in the implementation into Dutch national legislation. Um, or we addre address a little bit um, your second question. So what if what if companies are present in multiple EU countries? Um, with regard to the enforcement, um, enforcement will take place uh, in the country uh, where the head office is located, uh, so headquarters. Um, also because there is, um, they can be present in multiple uh, EU companies and maybe their presence uh, in, in, in a second or third EU country uh, might also reach the threshold um, with regard to employees and, and, and net turnover. Um, but usually uh, there, there, there is then a mother company or on group level where the uh, 
where the net turnover is also registered. Um, so in that country, the enforcement will uh, will take place. Uh, and that's also why yeah, the, the national supervisory authorities uh, have to collaborate in this in this network to um, to agree on that. Um, linkage to other regulation. Um, of course, there's yeah, there's there's several legislation now with a due diligence component, um, um, and of course the the CS Triple D now is kind of the yeah the core of this um, due diligence process is captured in that. Um, I already mentioned the CSRD, the reporting directive. Um, that has a requirement that companies report on their due diligence uh, process, um, and um, yeah, with all the um, with all the regu regulations with the due diligence component, the um, the effort of the Dutch government has been that um, as much as possible uh, they are based on uh, on the due diligence um, criteria by the OECD and the UNDP. So uh, that a similar approach is uh, is included in it. Um, one other, um, and I believe we foresee a presentation later after the summer, um, is the uh, forced labor regulation uh, that has also been, uh, well, at least within European Parliament being agreed upon. Uh, there is also a political agreement. Um, and I believe the council will do a final adaptation um, in the fall of this year. Um, and uh, well, we have to discuss with Isabel to, uh, to do a presentation on uh, the forced labor regulation later this year. Um, and that also, uh, yeah, that also includes uh, this due diligence component. Um, so there is, yeah, there is a lot of linkage. Um, and we, uh, we, we try that, uh, of course, the, the main component of due diligence is, uh, is being uh, similarly addressed in, in, in these uh, regulations. Um, so when companies uh, have set up a, a proper due diligence system, uh, they can be assured that within these different regulations, um, no, no new expectations are, are added to them, but then they are well prepared to, uh, to, uh, to address this, uh, these regulations. Also, uh, I think it's good for everybody to know that there will be a consultation. Uh, so for everybody that has thoughts and ideas, I think you said it will be open later on or in nine months or so, but uh, we will share the these also. Yes. Um, and indeed, we look forward to the presentation of the data after we start next year. Um, I'm now virtually looking at all the online participants to see if anybody has a question. Uh, because the people physically here in the room, we will continue um, also in, in a closer meeting uh, with you later on. Um, with five minutes to go, Marco, I'm looking at Nano and you now because you can see everybody. <laughs> Is anybody raising their hands? No, no raising hands, no QA, no chats. Come on, guys, this is your chance. Um, while waiting online, for you guys to type something, uh, let me ask you another one or two practical questions that might be applicable to everybody. Um, Jeroen, you mentioned uh, communicates on, uh, on due diligence. Uh, how do you expect companies to do this? This is mainly uh, via their annual journal. And your report, or will there also be other ways available for this? Um, yes, as mentioned, so the majority of these companies uh, will also fall under the reporting directive um, because of the, the scope that is now agreed upon. Um, so um, that will, yeah, that will uh, require them to uh, to report in their in their annual report. Um, if that's not the case, then uh, there's also the possibility within the, the CSDD. Uh, it mentions that at least um, communication via the corporate website uh, is expected on this uh, due diligence process. Um, so those are, yeah, I think the two main ways to uh, to communicate on this. Okay, thank you. Um, one question on the fine. I read in one sentence uh, the word maximum, but although at least five percent. Um, that's the different ways. Would it be a maximum of uh, 5% of uh, 
turnover? Pru, yeah, the um, the formulation of that one is uh, <laughs> uh, is raising eyebrows. I agree. Um, it's a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, it's it's uh, it's for certain companies. It's a lot of money, um, and also to say, um, with with regard to the enforcement, um, and of course, I cannot um, you know, go into specifics how other member states will will set this up. Um, but at least, um, and that also comes back to the national implementation. So in the Netherlands, um, we uh, we are now uh, talking, and already uh, the supervisory authority that is foreseen for this. Uh, is the authority for uh, consumers and markets. Not sure what the English name, ACM. <laughs> um, consumer and market uh, uh, um, affairs. Um, and um, the idea is, as mentioned, this, this due diligence, it is a process. Um, so the supervisory authority is also expected to first uh, uh, Question companies uh, when when things are found uh, to see what have what has been done. How did you communicate on this? Uh, how can you improve? Um, so uh, there's not uh, uh, any any expectations that in the first year of uh, implementation uh, they directly will start with these fines. Um, but this is uh, at least um, uh, uh, an administrative measure. Uh, that is being uh, incorporated uh, um, for the most you know, severe cases of companies really neglecting their obligations, um, and to, um, to 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 set this on the European level, they they, they set a maximum fine, um, at least five percent. Um, that 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 leaves room uh, if if member states have have different administrative penalties. Uh, to uh, to to change this percentage, but uh, at, they wanted to set at least a minimum, and um, that uh, that member states uh, would at least um, start on that uh, on that minimum threshold. Um, but depending on the member states, the, the percentage might be different. Um, although I can imagine that they will look at neighboring member states um, and and. Hopefully, also come to an agreement within the European Union uh, how to approach this and and make this um, equal for for the different member states. Um, I have one more question, and that's especially for people like myself who are not uh, too well versed about uh, the time that it might take in Brussels to get things going. Um, you mentioned that in twenty thirty there might be a first evaluation, especially with regard to the effect on SMEs. Uh, considering that um, for the large part of the project is related to uh, SMEs, um, that's quite a long way off. Um, wouldn't it be more applicable to already start looking after a first year of implementation, what the effect would be, could be on SMEs, and then, of course, take those elements uh, into improvements on the program? So, yeah, the directive. Um... As a number of of, of obligations uh, to to work together with SMEs and and not uh, push uh, these obligations uh, uh, one on one onto them, um, I think yeah the first evaluation as uh, it's a phase in application so it starts by twenty twenty seven, um, and I think the idea behind the the evaluation is that they at least want to have a number of years of experience with this directive uh, before they can uh, um, yeah, say anything about the effect of, of, of yeah, uh, how, uh, what is the impact of this legislation, how, how effective is it, um, or, or do changes need to be made? Um, so that is um, yeah, why, they, why they chose this this year. It's, it's, I think it's complicated after, uh, for the very large companies, um, after one year of implementation, um, to to already yeah conclude anything on the effects on on SMEs, um, of course they will they will receive feedback already during the process also with the implementation, um, the drafting of guidance, um, so of course earlier signals uh, can be taken into account, um, but yeah the 
the formal evaluation is foreseen for, uh, for 2030. And then after that, every three years, um, if I recall correctly, uh, an evaluation has to take place. Very much, you. Thank you, Marco. Um, you know, it's it's a uh, four o'clock here in Malaysia or, or ten o'clock in the Netherlands. So it means, uh, well, we're nearing the end of the online session. Um, a last question: Do you have any piece of advice or those listening in uh, now a last piece of advice that you would like to share with everybody? Um start uh, start preparing uh, but uh, and, and and don't don't be overwhelmed um, um, by the whole by the whole process um, but start with the first step uh, of the due diligence um, uh, and as mentioned see see where you can collaborate with uh, with, uh, with with businesses within your sector um, to not have to invent the wheel yourself on this um, but uh, but collaborate. Um, and, and share information where possible um, to um, to, uh, to make this um, to make this process um, yeah, easier on you. Thank you, Jeroen. Um, indeed, uh, just to share with everybody online, uh, if you don't know where to start, there is the RBC point at the Netherlands Enterprise Agency that you can always approach. Um, both the Netherlands Embassy in Kuala Lumpur and the MDPC are also at your disposal. Uh, but please also have a look at our YouTube page where also other Dutch companies present here in Malaysia have throughout the past years also shared their best practices um, with you know, implementable first steps to take. Um, so there's lots of joint learning. So good luck everybody. We're gonna continue here with the five session. So we're gonna close the webinar now and looking to forward to the next session. And thank you so much, you See you later this year on the fourth day, right? Yes. Thank you. you. Once, um, we will make a sanitized version of the climate of the room available. Uh, expected quite soon. Thank you for attending. Please uh, log out at this moment. And, uh, we would appreciate that. We can continue the uh, in-house session. We're also recording right now. Thank you.